chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Be beware of dogs. Beware of evildoers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul says here, in the midst of our persecutions, my brothers and sisters in Christ, rejoice in the Lord. Then we see the necessity of repetition. To say the same things he said to them previously was not grievous, but was a safety net for the Philippian church. Paul was never afraid of repetition. You know, it's kind of like preparing the same foods to eat week after week. We eat the same group of foods week after week. You know, the same it is with the word of God. And we should never get tired of it. We don't get tired of eating our food and natural food. Why should we get tired of eating the word of God, hearing it over and over again? Listen, it is our safety net against false teachers, against evil workers who pretend to be working for Christ and against the legalizers who believe that Christians have to keep the law of Moses for salvation and sanctification. Then he says that we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, what does Paul mean by that? Well, according to the Jewish belief, circumcision of the flesh was ordained upon Israel as a sign and symbol that they were the people with whom God had entered into a special relationship. And the story of the beginning of that sign is found in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. When God entered into his special covenant with Abraham, circumcision of the flesh was the established sign. That was then, though, under the old covenant. But now, under the new covenant, the real circumcision is of the heart. We, the believers, are the circumcision. Paul makes it very clear at the end of the epistle to the Galatians in Galatians 6 and 15. He says, neither circumcision availed anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Listen, God is not looking for a mere external observance. True circumcision is of the heart. It is the new birth, a new heart attitude toward God. True circumcision is being in Christ. It is no longer an outward circumcision, but an inner one. Then Paul gives three signs of true circumcision. Three signs. Number one, we worship God in the spirit. Number two, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. In other words, our only boast is in Jesus Christ. And number three, we have no confidence in human things. The Jew placed his confidence in the physical badge of circumcision and in the performance of the duties of the law. But the believer in Christ places his confidence only in the mercy of God and in the love of Jesus Christ. The Jew, in essence, trusted himself. But the believer in Christ, in essence, Trust God. The real circumcision is not a mark in the flesh. It is that true worship, that true glory, and that true confidence in the grace of God in Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at verses 4 through 7. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness that which is in the law. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Here Paul gives his credentials, not to boast, but to show that he had enjoyed every privilege which a Jew could enjoy and had risen to every attainment to which a Jew could rise. He knew what it was to be a Jew in the highest sense of the term and had deliberately abandoned it all for the sake of Jesus Christ. Look at the seven things he lists, his seven credentials here. He says, number one, circumcised the eighth day. He was circumcised when he was eight days old. It was the commandment of God to Abraham. He that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Genesis 17 and 12. And that commandment had been repeated as a permanent law of Israel in Leviticus 12 and 3. By this claim, Paul makes it clear that he is not an Ishmaelite. For the Ishmaelites were circumcised in their 13th year. That's found in Genesis 17, 25. Nor was he a proselyte who had come late into the Jewish faith and had been circumcised in manhood. He stresses the fact that he had been born into the Jewish faith and had known its privileges and observed its ceremonies since birth. 
All right. Number two of the stock of Israel. When the Jews wanted to stress their special relationship to God in its most unique sense, it was the word Israelite that they used. Israel was the name which had been specifically given to Jacob by God after his wrestling with the angel. It was to Israel that they, in the most special sense, traced their heritage. In fact, the Ishmaelites could trace their descent to Abraham, for Ishmael was Abraham's son by Hagar. The Edomites could trace their descent to Isaac, for Esau, the founder of the Edomite nation, was Isaac's son. But it was the Israelites alone who could trace their descent to Jacob, whom God had called by the name of Israel. And so by calling himself an Israelite, Paul stressed the absolute purity of his descent. All right. The third thing he says here of the tribe of Benjamin. Not only was Paul an Israelite, he also belonged to the elite of Israel. The tribe of Benjamin had a special place in Israel. Benjamin was the child of Rachel, the well-loved wife of Jacob. And of all the 12 patriarchs, he alone had been born in the promised land. It was from the tribe of Benjamin that the first king of Israel had come. And there was no doubt that from that very king that Paul had been given his original name of Saul. When under Rehoboam, the kingdom had been split up. Ten of the tribes went off with Jeroboam, and Benjamin was the only tribe which remained faithful with the tribe of Judah. When they returned from the exile, it was from the tribes of Benjamin and Judah that the nucleus of the reborn nation was formed. And that's found in in, in the book of Ezra, chapter 4 and verse 1. The tribe of Benjamin had the place of honor in Israel's battle line, so that the battle cry of Israel was, After thee, O Benjamin. The great feast commemorated the, the deliverance of which the book of Esther tells, and the central figure of that story was Mordecai, a Benjamite. When Paul stated that he was of the tribe of Benjamin, it was a claim that he was not simply an Israelite, but that he belonged to the highest part of or the highest status of Israel. Number four, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. The history of the Jews had dispersed them all over the world. In every town and in every city and in every country, there were Jews. There were tens of thousands of them in Rome and in Alexandria. There were more than a million. They stubbornly refused to be assimilated to the nations amongst whom they lived. They retained faithfully their own religion and their own customs and their own laws. But it frequently happened that they forgot their own language. They became Greek-speaking of necessity because they lived and moved in a Greek environment. Uh, A Hebrew was a Jew who was not only of pure racial descent, but who had deliberately and often laboriously retained the Hebrew tongue. Such a Jew would speak the language of the country in which he lived, but also the Hebrew, which was his ancestral language. Paul claims not only to be a pure-blooded Jew, but one who still spoke Hebrew. He had been born in the Gentile city of Tarsus, but he had come to Jerusalem to be educated at the feet of Gamaliel and was able, for instance, when the time came to speak to the mob in Jerusalem in their own tongue. All right. The fifth thing he says, as touching the law of Pharisee, as far as the law went, Paul was a trained Pharisee. This is a claim that Paul makes more than once. There were not very many Pharisees, never more than 6,000, but They were the spiritual athletes of Judaism. Their very name means the separated ones. They had separated themselves off from all common life and from lives to keep every smallest detail of the law. Paul claims that not only was he a Jew who had retained his ancestral religion, but he had also devoted his whole life to its most rigorous observance. No man knew better from personal experience what Jewish religion was at its highest than Paul. Then he said concerning zeal persecuting the church. As far as zeal went, Paul had been a persecutor of the church. To a Jew, zeal was the greatest quality in the religious life. And we see this very clearly. Hyenas had saved the people from the wrath of God and had been given an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God. In Numbers chapter 25, verses 11 through 13, it is the cry of the psalmist. In Psalm 69 and 6, zeal for thy house has consumed me. A burning zeal for God was the hallmark of Jewish religion. Paul had been so zealous a Jew that he had tried to wipe out the opponents of Judaism. That was a thing which he never forgot. 
Again and again, he speaks of it. He was never ashamed to confess his shame <laughs> and to tell men that once he had hated the Christ, uh, the Christian life, the, the Christ whom now he loved and sought to destroy uh, the church which now he served. It is Paul's claim that he knew Judaism at its most intense. The other Pharisees were willing to relax when they had run the Christians out of Jerusalem, but Paul was determined to wipe them out all over the world. That was his purpose on his way to Damascus before being stopped by Jesus Christ himself. And number seven, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul claims that there was no demand of the law which he did not fulfill. As for the righteousness which the law could produce, he was blameless. So we see here in this passage, Paul stated in his attainments. He was so loyal a Jew that he had never lost the Hebrew speech. He was not only a religious Jew, he was a member of their strictest and most self-disciplined sect. He had in his heart a burning zeal for what he had thought was the cause of God. And he had a record in Judaism in which no man could mark a fault. Paul thought that all of his accomplishments were something special until he met Jesus Christ. And when he met Jesus, he wrote his accomplishments off as nothing. He stripped himself of every human claim of honor that he might accept in complete humility the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. So Paul proves here he had the right to speak. He was not condemning Judaism from the outside looking in. He had experienced it at its highest point, and he knew that nothing could paired with the joy which Christ had given him. He knew that the only way to peace was to abandon the way of human achievement and to accept the way of grace. Verses 8 and 9, chapter 3. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now Paul says here, I gave up the philosophy of men to receive the excellent knowledge of Christ Jesus. Paul flushed his religion down the drain. He flushed away everything he used to trust. He only trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am in him, not by my own works of or, or righteousness or by my own religious actions, which is of the law, but I have received him by faith. Listen, the only way to receive salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. You can't borrow it. You can't steal it. You can't buy it and you can't work for it. It only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at verses 10 through 14. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the power of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehend, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says here that I may know him. This is a a progressive, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. He already knew God, but wanted an even closer relationship with Jesus. And this too should be our desire to have an ever increasing intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. He says that I may know the power of his resurrection. The same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power in us, the Holy Spirit. He wanted an ever increasing understanding of the power of God that works in us. And he had his eyes on his eternal home being clothed with the same type of glorious body that Jesus Jesus rose from the grave with, that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul counted it an honor to suffer physically for Jesus Christ. He didn't mind suffering for Christ because Jesus Christ suffered tremendously like no man has ever suffered or will suffer for us so that we could have eternal life. And in light of this, Paul says, I am willing to continue to suffer for him. And we're talking about an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Then he says, being conformed to his debt. Paul was willing to imitate Jesus Christ even in his debt. In other words, he was willing to be completely obedient to God the Father, just like Jesus was obedient to his Father's will in the garden when he prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, my, not my will, but your will be done. 
Paul was willing to die for Jesus Christ, just like Jesus was willing to die for us. We're talking about, again, an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Then he says, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, what Paul is saying here is this. After I die for the sake of Christ, the next step is the resurrection from the dead. Yes, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But here are the key words, absent. From the body. When we die, our spirit man, which has been reborn, which is in us, which is us, immediately enters the presence of the Lord. But our bodies goes back to the earth. But when Jesus returns, our, re our reborn spirit man will be clothed with his new house. We will receive a glorified body just like Jesus had when he rose from the dead. And all of this shall happen in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye. He goes on to say that he had not yet experienced the glorified state. Then he says, either we're already perfect. Now the word perfect here means mature, complete, or finished. He is saying here that God had not completed the work that he had begun in him. In other words, Paul had not finished God's mission for his life, but he was determined to finish it. He refused to abort the mission. He was committed to his assignment given to him by God. He was determined to cross the finish line on top. And this is how he said he would accomplish it. I'm going to keep pressing forward, forgetting about my past achievements and successes, and to look constantly on what I have yet to accomplish for God. I'm not going to dwell on my credentials. I'm not going to dwell on yesterday's anointing. I'm not going to dwell on the, num the number of souls who got saved under my ministry in the past, but my eyes are only on what I have yet to do for Christ. And the word he uses for reaching forth is very vivid, and it is used of a runner going hard for the tape. It describes him with eyes for nothing but the goal. Listen, when a runner runs, all that is on his mind is the finish line. As he runs, he doesn't keep up with or think about how much grounds he has covered. All he is concerned about is finishing and finishing on top. Now, what is the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus that Paul was striving or pressing on for? The prize is a certain reward for service. But what is the reward? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 10 through 12, reading from the New King James Version. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward. For great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, then, then Paul identifies the great reward given to those individuals who renders this level of service in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Again, reading from the New King James Version. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, finally, it's so close I can taste it. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. My God, I love that. Hallelujah. Now let's, let's, let's look at verses 15 and 16. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Now here we see the word perfect again. Again, the word perfect means mature, finished, or complete. Here Paul speaks of the mature state in Christ. Now there are two states in Christ. You got the babes in Christ and the matured ones in Christ, the mature state. And within the mature state in Christ, there are different levels. Just for an example, for a natural example, a 21-year-old person is matured, but is not as matured as a 40-year-old. Now, Paul tells the Philippian believers here that regardless of what level we are on spiritually, let us all walk by the same rule. What rule? The rule of always keeping our eyes on the prize, always pressing forward and never looking back on our past successes until we win the prize. We must complete God's mission. We must complete God's assignment for our lives. All right. And verses 17 through 21. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an 
in sample. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now Paul instructs here the Philippian church to adhere to his words and to follow his example. He says, don't let nobody turn your hearts from the truth and remember where your true citizenship are. Your citizenship is in heaven and make sure that your conduct matches your citizenship. Then Paul finishes this chapter with the Christian hope. The Christian awaits the coming of Jesus Christ. The day that we will lay aside this decaying body which we now possess or live in and we will become just like Jesus Christ himself. First John chapter 3 verses 1 and through 3 says this. Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not beloved now are we the sons of God and it do not yet appear what we shall be but we know glory to God that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and every man that had this hope in him purified himself even as he is pure